Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Unlock the Stock. We are pleased to welcome for the first time to Unlock the Stock, Oceana Group. The group was established in 1918, making them 106 years old. So it's going to be fascinating to learn more about the operations and the brands that make up the group. The Unlock the Stock platform is specifically formulated for retail investors to get to know the company and their management teams just a little bit better. We welcome today Neville Bester, the CEO, and Zaf Mohammed, the CFO, who will join us today and take you through a presentation shortly. Unlock the Stock is only possible with our technology partners, Lumi Global. Please visit the Lumi Global website sorry, lumiglobal.com, to learn more about Lumi's various online AGM and investor presentation solutions. Our host today will be the Finance Ghost and Mark Tobin of Coffee Microcaps, and they will facilitate the Q&A session. Before we start, there are just a few housekeeping rules. Neville and Zaf will take you through a presentation which will be followed by Q&A. You can post your questions by typing them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. The event is being recorded and will be available on the Unlock the Stock YouTube channel next week. You will see an email address when we begin the Q&A session. And if you would like to be added to Oceana's contact database, please take note of that email address. Neville and Zaf, I am ready for you to share your screen and to take us through the presentation, please. Thanks, Vanessa, um, and welcome everybody that's joined us. Uh, first time for us, so very excited to share some information about Oceana. Um, as you said, Oceana is 106 years old. Um, I, uh, I'm not quite as old as that, but I've been in the fishing industry for 35 years, uh, been the CEO for three years, fishing and, and vessels and, 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 and crew are in my blood. Um, it's something that I, I do for the passion. Uh, more so than the work. So very excited to talk a bit about our business. Um, so I'm going to give you a, a brief overview of, of, and obviously I'm going to try and keep it short so I can give as much time to questions, but I'm going to give you a brief overview of, of um, Oceana and, and how we structured and where we operate in. Um, so just as a start, you know, this is a, just to give everybody, that's a, going to go back one there, just so I understand. This is a, one of our fishing vessels on the west coast of, of Africa. It's a pelagic uh, purse seiner. It catches pilchards and anchovy uh, and delivers to one of our factories on the west coast. And, and what you'd see out of that vessel or what you would eat in a Lucky Star can. So one of our vessels, but I'll talk about the broad structure now. So, next slide. So Ocean is a, is a global fishing and food processing company. We operate across the world. Um, we employ over just short of 4,000 em uh, employees. Uh, we've got produ production facilities all over the world, 48 fishing vessels. Um, and we specialize in catching and procuring fish, but we also process uh, in the fish meal and fish oil side and uh, in canned food as well. Just a, a map, just to give you an indication of where we operate. And this is a, both from a processing and a, from a selling point of view. We've got operations in South Africa, Namibia, and the US, but we essentially sell across the world. Um, South America, North America, a lot into Southern Europe uh, uh, and Southern Africa. We've got some affordable proteins we're selling to Southern Africa. And then we've got some uh, product that goes to the Far East uh, in China, Korea. Um, and that part of the world, so across the world, and then in, in, in Australia, so a very diverse group of uh, diverse market, and we're both in export and import. The way we the way we manage this business is, and we call them three pillars. Um, there are a number of statutory companies in these three pillars, but broadly speaking, this is how we manage the business. And I'll start off with our branded business, and I'm sure all of you have heard of Lucky Star. Um, Lucky Star is a, is a household brand. It's been around for 70 years. And uh, we, we process pilchards through the two canneries, one in, two in South Africa and two in, uh, in the Middle East, in China and in Thailand. 
and we process and sell to the Southern African market. We do some exports, but predominantly our, our sales are in South Africa, a very uh, massive brand. And in fact, this year it got voted the most iconic brand in South Africa. So that is the one pillar of our business and it includes cannering and marketing. Uh, the second pillar of our business is what we call fish meal and oil. Um, and you'll see there's a little red square that crosses the two. The reason we do that is because in our Lucky Star side, we have the two canneries that also have fish meal and oil plants that are attached to it because when we process fish to put in a can, we cut the head off and we cut the tail off and that product will go into fish meal. And fish meal is a, a feed ingredient that generally goes into the aquaculture or the pet food market. So in, in our fish meal and oil segment, we have two specific businesses, the South African business that I just spoke about. And then we have a large operation operating out of the Gulf of Mexico, um, the, Gulf, the, the Gulf area. Our factory is actually in Louisiana on the Mississippi River, where we operate a factory uh, and uh, 12 vessels that fish. And they, they, they steam down the Mississippi into the Gulf, catch fish, Every day they come back to the up the Mississippi, offload to our factory, and produce fish meal and oil. And essentially, what you do for fish meal and oil is you you cook the fish, you separate the flesh from the from the oil, and you dry the flesh, and that goes and both of the and goes into into aquaculture, and you separate the oil and you purify it, and it goes into feed. Whether the feed is for a salmon farm or for a eel farm or for a or for the pet food manufacturers that dog food that goes into the pet food manufacturing. So we, we, although we're not in aquaculture, we're a big supplier into the aquaculture sector because they buy our product for feed and, uh, and an ingredient. And the reason it's, it's very popular is because it promotes health of whatever fish or, or animal you're feeding, and it promotes growth. It's a growth, whole, or a, a growth component. It's got protein in it. So it, it stimulates growth. So a very big part of our business in the US and, the, and SA where we produce those two products. And then on the pure fishing side, where we, we call it wild-caught seafood, this is product for human consumption, uh, and we operate in South Africa and Namibia, and we're in a range of species. As you can see there, horse mackerel, hake, squid, and lobster. We operate factory vessels that, that fish at sea with factories on board, that process it on board, comes, comes along, discharges into coal stores in South Africa and Namibia, and then we export all over the world. And I'll go into a little more detail in each of these businesses, so it gives you an an idea of how we sell and where we sell. So go back to the start, Lucky Star, canned foods, um, and we say foods, it's not fish, as much as we produce pilchards in, and that's our dominant product. We also do some other food products um, uh, into the sector and we produce it ourselves. So here's a map of where we have, go back to the map. So we have uh, two factories in South Africa, um, along the west coast, St. Lina Bay and Felt Drift, uh, and one factory in, in, in Volfus Bay. We uh, process about 10 million cartons a year, um, and only 10 to 15% of the production comes from our own catch. Uh, the pilchard resource is simply not big enough in South Africa to, to meet the demand. That brand has grown exponentially over the last 70 years. So a large portion, as I said, 85 to 90% of our ingredients, our raw material that goes into the can comes from all over the world. So we have a very sophisticated procurement team that visits all of the major players in the world that catch and process um, pilchards. Pilchards and sardine are essentially the same thing. The sardine run that you hear about along the Natal coast, that is the, that, that goes into our can, but we call it pilchards, same thing. And we buy from Mexico, we buy a lot from Northwest Africa, Mauritania, Morocco, and we buy from the Pacific uh, around the J Japanese waters. That product is caught by various vessels, not our own vessels, um, and then delivered to one of our two factories in South Africa and, and Namibia. We also have contract factories, as you can see, one in Thailand and one in China, um, that produce product for us. Uh, so depending on where we catch, where we buy this product, a lot of the Pacific pro product will go into those two canneries, and they deliver it. Our canneries just cannot keep up uh, with the production. We produce about 5 million cartons, 5 to 6 million cartons through our canneries in South Africa, and about 4 million cartons through the two canneries that we contract. 
just on the pulchered resource, which is very important, the pulchered resource, if you go back in, in my history, uh, both in South Africa and Namibia, uh, was in excess of, two, of 200,000 tons. And all of the pulchards, all the Lucky Star requirements was from own catch. Over the years, that resource in, in Namibia in particular has disappeared. There's a moratorium on pulchards in the moment in Namibia. But in South Africa, it's starting to come back. And you can see the graph on the left-hand side. That's the TAC, total allowable catch, that we as a fishing industry are allocated and we are allowed to catch it. So that's a very positive sign for us because effectively the fish we catch in our local waters is cheaper than the fish that we have to import from all over the world. So we would like to see that graph, graph improve. And that sign there, you can see the, 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 the last four or five years as we've seen that, that pulchid uh, resource grow. And this year, there's been a six, plus 60% increase in the TAC, very positive sign for us and for the and for, and for the resource. Next stop. Just uh, give you an idea of the products we produce. Uh, top left is our canned fish, obviously the dominant volume that we produce. Lucky Star pulches in chili and tomato and in mints. We are going to be launching a new flavor in the next month, as you can see the one with the question mark in, but that dominates uh, the volume that we produce. Um, those two factories in Thailand and China that uh, produce for us, they produce some value-added products. Um, obviously, the left-hand side plays in the, in the affordable proteins sector. On the right top, we produce tuna, mackerel, and sardines. That's the Mor Moroccan sardines in oil. High-value items at the top end of the market sold into retail. We, 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 uh, we contract back that through the two Chinese and, and Thai factories. On the bottom left is... Uh, a fairly new um, range for us, corn meat. You probably know the, the Rhodes um, bull brand corn meat. We are now playing in that space, Lucky Star corn meat. It's fairly new for us. We opened that factory in November of, this, of last year, started our first production um, and, started, and, and, and went into the trade in March of this year. So it's still early days, but we believe that certainly has a, a lot of traction for us to grow our, our expansion um, and the reason we're doing this is because Lucky Star is the brand, and I said it's, it was voted the, the number one brand in the country this year, has huge appeal to a mass of consumers. And we believe that we can spread that brand outside of pure fish into other uh, affordable proteins. So the, the one is corn meat, and then we've just acquired a new business called Lucky Star Chicken Livers. It's a business that uh, we bought in Kraft We bought a, a majority stake in that business, and it's a it, it, at the moment, it's majority supplying the um, school feeding schemes. I don't know if you know that uh, the state feeds ten and a half million kids a day, and they are and, and and they need protein. And one of the proteins that that is being supplied to them is chicken livers. We bought that business, and we see that a natural extension, not so, not only in the school feeding schemes, but outside of that into retail or wholesale. So that's a that's a a new business. Both those businesses are new business for us. Uh, are in fact, are not in our figures, the figures that Zap will go through just now. And we see that as a, as a major growth path for, for Lucky Star. And then on the bottom left, we do some canned vegetables. Um, those are co-packed from us for a packer in, in, in the Johannesburg area. Um, all vegetable baked products with some gravy, with some so soya, Lucky Star baked beans, and a chaka laka, very popular in the, in, in the consumer that buys Lucky Star. So a nice range of products. But still, there's a lot of opportunity to expand the Lucky Star outside of these products, and that will be a continuous um, strategy for us to take that product wider. Then the fish oil and, and meal business, as I said, we've got um, two canneries or two fish meal and oil plants in South Africa, and uh, and one in in uh, US in the in the south in the Gulf area. Um, the product is produced in those areas and then sold all over the world. The, the, the oil is mainly supplying the um, Scandinavian salmon farms, the aquaculture farms that are growing salmon. As you know, salmon has become very, um, very, very popular worldwide. And the growth of the salmon farms has been exponential over the last 10 years. And a key ingredient in the feed that they feed uh, the salmon is oil, fish oil. It has to have a component of omega-3 oils as a, as a as I said earlier, it stimulates growth. Animals grow faster, and it also stimulates health uh, in the fish. They need a, a natural oil that comes from fish in the ingredient to keep them healthy. 
So a large, uh, 90% of our oil goes into those two markets, into that Scandinavian salmon markets. Uh, the fish meal that we produce out of South Africa goes to Europe, quite a bit to Africa and a little bit to the uh, aquaculture industry in China. The, the majority of the fish meal produced in the U.S. goes into the U.S. pet food market. Pet food is a massive market, one of the largest markets in the world for pet food. Um, and because of our proximity to that market, it's not a, it doesn't have to be imported. We have, we have warehouses. We can supply the big manufacturers there with um, the local pet food, the local fish meal that goes into their pet food. That's just a picture of the slide of, of our factory. That's the Mississippi. Those are our vessels there. They're very flat vessels. Uh, we operate the way we operate there. They have two purse sainers on the back of the vessels. You'll see there's a little ramp at the back of the vessels. That ramp uh, launches two little purse sainers. They go and circle the fish, pull the net close. The, the mothership goes alongside, puts a pump into the water, pumps the fish into the hold of the mothership, and then the mothership comes back to the factory every day. We operate from about April to October every year, and it's a it's what's called the Olympic system. We're not we're not governed by tonnage. We're governed by time, and you can catch as much as you can in that time. That's the way the the the, the regulation and the fisheries um, department regulate that industry. Very profitable business and very good business. Very simple but very profitable. And then lastly, our wild caught seafood. Um, that vessel you're seeing there is a, a typical uh, Hake factory vessel that goes out at sea and fishes in our waters, in the South African waters. Um, but we do Hake, horse mackerel, squid, and lobster. Just go to the map. So, as I said, the wild caught operates out of Namibia and South Africa. In South Africa, we have four Hake vessels, those are factory vessels that go out every day. Um, and will fish at sea for an average of 20 to 30 days. They fish with a factory on board and they catch hake and a whole range of what's called bycatch, things like monk, king clip, uh, the horse mackerel, uh, ribbon fish. Um, and it's processed on board in a very basic form. We, we gut it, we take the head and tail off, and we pack it in a, in a 10 kilo box. And that, that uh, product is sold mainly to the food service markets all over the world. Um, so hake goes mainly to Western Europe and South Africa, uh, and then, then it's processed into retail packs or to, into canteens in, in southern, southern Europe, Spain, Italy, Portugal. Uh, a lot of hake is obviously sold in South Africa. You've obviously eaten hake in, in any restaurant. That comes from, from our type of vessel. We then do two, we have three vessels, one in South Africa, one in, uh, two in Namibia catching mackerel. In South Africa, it's called horse mackerel. There are a number of mackerels around the world. Ours is called horse mackerel. And that's a very basic protein. So we catch the fish on board in a, as is, no head off, no tail off, no guts off, eyes in. It gets packed in a, in a 10 kilo block, frozen in that block on board, comes alongside and it's sold into Africa. Massive African market, mainly Southern uh, and West Africa, DRC, Kinshasa, that area, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, very big, um, very popular in those markets, sold in, in bulk and then sold in, in uh, the local um, street vendors will cook it on, on alongside and people come and eat, buy one, one mackerel and, and have it for lunch or for dinner. So very, very big market, high volume, low value, very profitable when the, when the catch rates are good, obviously expensive vessels to, to run. So when catch rates drop off, it is, it is a marginal business, but a very good business for us over years. Then we have our two smaller businesses, the Squid Operation, which is off the east coast of South Africa. And if you've been to PE or Cape St. Francis, you would have seen the vessels that fish at night uh, at sea. You'll see them with all the lights. Uh, those are squid jiggers, hand jigs. So you've got a whole crew of them standing on, alongside, uh, along the side of the vessel. They hold the line in their hand and they and they jig the line. It's a little upturned hook, no bait, and they catch squid um, and they process it on board in whole form. No, it's not gutted or, or headed. Um, we have blast freezers on board and that product comes alongside, it's boxed alongside, goes out, the vessel go for 20 days and that product is boxed and then sold to Southern Europe. Very, very popular in, uh, in Spain, Portugal, Italy, France, um, 
And all of the calamari that you eat here, squid is calamari, all the calamari you eat in South Africa is all imported calamari from other parts of the world that is a lot cheaper than ours. Ours is very high value. Um, and and we we command a five times premium to the the imported uh, calamari that you would eat from Peru that comes into our into our uh, restaurants. And then the last uh, species we catch is lobster. And in South Africa, you have two species of lobster: one on the west coast, and one on the east coast. The west coast is a typical lobster that you'll see that are sold um, in most of our restaurants or on the side of the streets. Um, up in St. Lena Bay or Paternoster, there are a lot of there, and that's a, a shallow water lobster. We have a number of vessels that catch that, and that is sold mainly live to China. We, we catch it live, it goes into tanks, we keep it alive, we pack it in polystyrene boxes, um, we chill the lobster down so that it goes into a sense of hibernation, we fly to, to China, they take it out in that side and they put it in tanks, same, same sea temperature water, uh, same salinity level, and then they revive the, the lobster and sell it to the restaurants. Um, unfortunately, the West Coast rock, rock lobster is being heavily poached. Um, unfortunately, government just don't have the, the structures to stop the poaching, and we are concerned that that species will disappear, like abalone is under threat here, the West Coast lobster. We work with the, the authorities on an ongoing basis to try and manage the poaching. We are obviously the eyes and ears of the industry, of the, the regulators, but it's a tough ask because we've got a long coastline and there's massive socioeconomic problems along our coastline. So it's very difficult to stop. The last lobster species we catch is an East Coast, also off PE. It's a deep water lobster. We catch it at about 250 meters deep. Um, we process it on board, factory vessels. Most of it is tailed, very high value, very, very popular in particular in the States. All of that lobster goes to the tails, to the, to the white tablecloth restaurants in Vegas, in New York, um, in Chicago, and is it sold at very high prices in, in, in a very good species, a very good uh, business for us. It's not being poached because it's obviously a deep water lobster, you need very expensive vessels to get them to, to, to fish it. So that's what's called the wild caught species, all human consumption species, we, we fish all the commercial species in Southern Africa, and we export it mainly to, the, to, to across the world. Um, and there's just some pictures of that bottom right is a typical squid vessel. You can see the lights on the top. The top right is a, a hake vessel, and bottom left uh, is also a hake vessel. So, uh, no, sorry, that's a horse mackerel vessel. That's a, and the horse mackerel, the, the vessel in, in South Africa, the Desert Diamond, is the largest sea uh, fishing vessel in Southern Africa. 120 meters long, has a crew of about 120, and is a factory vessel, has a, has a, uh, a full factory on board. So that gives you a kind of overview. And, and I think just before Zef actually comments and, and before her questions, one of the strengths of Oceana is our diversity. We, we're not in one particular species, like some of our competitors in South Africa, we're across the range of species. We're not in one particular geography. We're in all over the world, and we're not in one particular currency. So we are fairly naturally hedged as a as a against the against the rand. We're probably 50-50 in terms of exports and imports with our U.S. business and our exports. And obviously, Lucky Star is predominantly a South African uh, product sold in rands. So it's, it's, it's a diverse business. I wish all the business would fire all the time. That doesn't always happen, as you'll see in the results. One of our businesses had a tough year this year. But because of the diversity of the group, and because of our, our, our spread of geographies and currencies, we always, over the last couple of years, have been able to offset uh, you know, slowdowns in one or other business by, by the other businesses doing well. Hopefully one day all of them will fire and it'll be a phenomenal year. So... This, so I'll ask Zaf to take you through the, um, the results, the high-level key drivers of our results, and this is our interim results, half year, and then take you through some of the numbers, and then happy to answer questions. Thank you, Neville. Um, from a uh, is your slide on my side. You go. Okay. I'm happy to jump in. Okay. Uh, I think what was a key uh, distinction in our results was the record first half earnings for Daybrook. In US dollar terms, we were up 115%. We made more money in six months in Daybrook at 850 million, just, just under 850 million. 
than we did in the entire 12 months of last year. And that was primarily due to the high fish oil price, together with some of the CapEx investments that we did in Daybrook, which allowed us to benefit from the higher fish oil price. And from a Lucky Star point of view, uh, as Neville mentioned, uh, we were rated the number one iconic brand in South Africa, and that's a very, very strong value offering to consumers. We sell about 800,000, well, actually, we consume, South Africans consume 800,000 cans per day, just to give you a, an idea of the scale of that business. We also had very much improved second quarter sales volumes. We had uh, the Easter break in April last year, moved to March this year, and what we've seen in in uh, April and May is a continuation of that strong demand. And with the brand extensions that we've got coming on, on stream from about April onwards, um, we, we're starting to see canned meat go into the market following the start of production at the end of last year, as well as the chicken liver business that we've acquired 75% of. That, that business is starting to go into the market uh, effective from April. Then from a Lucky Star operations point of view, we've got two factories on the West Coast, as Neville mentioned. Uh, they are both canneries and fish meal plants. We've done massive upgrades uh, to both of them. Uh, they're part of a multi-phase investment program that we've put in. Uh, this uh, fishing rights uh, application that we put in for 15 years has allowed us to now invest with confidence. Uh, some of the capex that we've put in has been compliance in nature. We've also put in a canned meat plant and what we've done is we've taken some of the lessons that we've learned in Daybrook and brought that to South Africa, which is really about making sure that when the fish are there, we are in the best position to be able to extract maximum value. Uh, and that's what our CapEx is focused on. And from a wild caught business, uh, it was a poor year, a poor half year, I would say. And then lower volumes offset by really strong demand. We continue to see strong demand as well as pricing for our products in the wild caught seafood business. Then from an investment point of view, we always pride ourselves on having a very strong balance sheet to be able to fund growth opportunities. Uh, we've focused on reducing our net debt. Our net debt reduced by about 17% uh, between the last half year and this half year. And really from a balance sheet point of view, we're in the best position to look at any growth opportunities that come our way. So coming back to how we performed in the first half, Revenue was up 12%, and you'll notice that even though our revenue was only up 12%, our operating profit was up 57%, and that's due to Daybrook increasing its uh, uh, operating profit margin to 47% in the six months. Again, record uh, operating profit of 1 billion Rand, as I mentioned earlier, together with revenue of 5 billion Rand. Our headline earnings per share was assisted by a lower tax rate in the US, but Daybrook contributing uh, a, a higher proportion of the first half, uh, that benefit has started to come through. And our interest uh, cost actually came down by about uh, 3 million Rand. So with interest staying flat, you can see the, the multiplier effect on our headline earnings up 85%. We recognize that uh, we want to reward our shareholders with the excellent first half performance, but keeping in mind the CapEx that's still to come for the rest of this year, we paid an interim dividend of 50%. That will be paid at the end of this month and uh, increased from 130 cents per share to 195 cents per share. Net debt, as I mentioned, is very comfortable. It allows us to have the balance sheet capacity to look at other opportunities, but down 17% to 2.5 billion. So from an operating profit point of view, Typically, we would have been a 40-60 split between the first half and the second half. The first half is in blue, the second half is in gold. Um, and our operating profit margin, as you can see there, is significantly higher than what it's been over the last two years. And this first half, the highest it's been in the last five years, again, driven by Daybrook's performance at over a billion rand, of which Daybrook contributed uh, just under 850 million rand. And then on the right hand side, you can see the makeup between the different divisions. Uh, 848, uh, as you can see there in blue, is the Daybrook contribution. Uh, on an annual basis, uh, Daybrook used to contribute about 22% of our total operating profit about three years ago. And in the last financial year, contributed 56%. And now it's over 80%. With the successful uh, performance of 
Daybrook. It's unlikely that that will be repeated in the second half. Um, we think that fish oil prices will moderate. So from a going forward point of view, we don't expect that those fish oil prices will remain at the high levels that they've been uh, for the last 12 months. Next slide. Next slide. So uh, just to give a little very quick view in terms of what uh, long-term strategy is, I mean, the first one is bolt-on acquisitions, and I, I've said this over the last few days. Our view in terms of our business is that there are a lot of opportunities, small opportunities, multiple small opportunities to add into our business, whether it's an acquisition of a squid business or additional brand extension in terms of Lucky Star. Uh, and it's far from a, from a risk profile point of view, it's far ri less risky to, to have multiple small opportunities than one big silver, we, silver bullet. Um, we're getting a number of uh, inquiries for businesses all over the world, in particular for fishing businesses, and we are very wary about, you know, going in with this mass acquisition, uh, which is high risk um, and just makes us bigger, not necessarily better. So the focus is going to be on bolt-on acquisitions, brand extensions, a lot of, you know, we've got a massive uh, capex spend over the next three years, 1.2 billion that we're spending on the West Coast in our canneries and our fish mill plants to make them more efficient and more, uh, and give them the ability to, to receive a lot more stock. Um, and to be able to process when the fish are there, because the nature of fishing is you can't control weather, you can't control the waves, the wave height, you can't control wind. But when when you get an opportunity and the vessels are out there fishing, you want to make sure that those factories have the maximum capacity to take the fish and turn those vessels around and put them back to sea. So big focus on the west coast and our factories. On the wild court, you saw Zaf say the numbers uh, didn't look good in the first half for wild court. We have spent a lot of money, and the re one of the reasons is we're upgrading those vessels. So when you upgrade a vessel, you take it out of commission. A vessel alongside doesn't make money, but those vessels, it's an upgrade in terms of increased capacity and improved quality. So in, in this last six months, we've been upgrading two vessels. So effectively, we had half the fleet. We did have one major breakdown, that large vessel I spoke about, Desert Diamond. But again, the focus in that wild court sector is really to upgrade those vessels in terms of capacity and quality. And then we're looking at some new innovations um, across the board. You, I spoke about the, uh, the like the chicken, chicken livers, that's something brand new. We think that there's huge opportunities in both retail and wholesale and expanding into, into uh, the other sectors of the, food, of the uh, school feeding scheme. So we've got lots on our plate over the next couple of years, but lots of exciting stuff. So I think that, Gives us about 25 minutes for questions. So open to questions from, from uh, the audience. Thank you so much, Neville. And Zaf, I'm going to actually at this point just hand you over to Mark and the Finance Ghost. And just as a reminder, please pop your questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Over to you guys. Thanks, Vanessa. And yeah, thanks to Neville and Zaf and the whole Oceania team for joining us for the first time today on, on Lock This Stock. Uh, I've got one question in already. And yeah, I think it's maybe worth touching on in a in a broader sense, just on um, you know, fishing sustainability. Um, you know, quotas, uh, I come from Ireland, quotas are a big topic all the time when yeah. they come around to renegotiation at a European um level. Maybe just talk about, you know, that and, you know, work that, you know, people probably see on uh, on labels, Marine Stewardship Council uh, logos uh, uh, on various yeah. brands that has come to the fore in the last maybe 10 years or so. Just, yeah, sustainability of fishing as an industry more broadly and, you know, what Oceana's impact on that and, and how you're responding to that. Yeah, I'm happy to talk about that, and it's a, and it's something we talk about a lot. And it's you know, if you read our integrated report, it, it forms part of our integrated report. Remember, we've been around for a hundred years, and we want to be around for another hundred years. And the only way we can do that is to be sustainable. So, first of all, all of the fisheries that we work in, with the exception of West Coast lobster, and I spoke a bit about West Coast lobster, our concerns are there that 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 resource is not sustainable. We could exit it. Government has asked us not to exit it because it gives them some eyes and ears to, to help them police the West Coast rock lobster. 
all of the other species we are are, are sustainable. They're governed and managed by, by the regulators, whether it be in America, US, or SA. And even the product that we import um, for, for um, our Lucky Star Supply is, is managed through a government agency. Government agencies generally have scientists in their, in their employ. They, what they do is they measure the size of the resource. They call it the biomass. They measure the biomass, and they give you a target quota to catch, which, and the way they calculate that is it, it needs to be sustainable to keep the, the, the health of the biomass on a long-term upward tra trajectory. So all of our species are very much controlled. We, we do subscribe to MSC. So a number of our fisheries are MSC, Marine Stewardship Council accredited. Our hake, South African hake is accredited. Our Manhattan species, which is the species we catch on the Gulf of Mexico, is also accredited. But Jenny, we, we, um, we are very conscious about um, uh, you know, sustainability and it's, it's a, a key component for us. So we would not be in a species that, that potentially could be overfished or, and the, you know, there's this misnomer that in South African waters and Namibian waters, there's mass foreign vessels coming in and fishing in our waters and poaching till. That is nonsense. Our fishery is managed very effectively by our regulators. We have patrol vessels, but generally the fishing industry, the regulated industry, tends to be the patrol vessels. So we would be the eyes and ears, and if there was a Chinese vessel coming in and catching squid, we'd be the first to alert the regulator. He has vessels, he has uh, patrol vessels available. They would arrest that vessel and it would be port, brought into the port, and it has happened, and, they've, and they, um, they auction that vessel out. So very key component for us to to manage our our fisheries sustainably. Thank you. Uh, to the Oceana team, thank you for uh, joining your first Unlock the Stock. I'm on the road, so hopefully the, the noise in the back's not too bad of the road noise. But what I wanted to ask is, I mean, it's clear there's bigger ambitions for Lucky Star. I mean, everyone just knows it as the Pilchard's brand, really. We were joking before we came on about whether or not Tito Mbaweni is in fact a paid influencer for you, for some of the things I see on Twitter. But uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm sure you can deny that categorically. Uh, categorically if he is a paid influencer, yeah. you should probably find someone who makes things look more appealing than what we are treated to on his socials. But on a serious note, I mean, the, the Lucky Star brand, you're clearly going a lot broader. I guess what I'm keen to understand is what is your edge in something like going into, you know, the baked beans? We see from Tiger Brands, pricing power is not always there. So sometimes they are very much beholden to, you know, the greater market forces. Is there an edge for you in that space? It feels quite commoditized, um, especially with where grocery stores are going with private label as well, and obviously trying to push that as much as they can. So fun and scarce. I mean, baked beans is a tiny little product, and it, it really just gives us visibility on the shelf. I, you know, that's really not where we find the edge. The edge is in uh, particular where we can control the raw material, and has the, has the ability to fit into our logistics chain. So same truck, same factory, same customer, same distribution. That's where we, we really see the value in terms of extending the brand, like corn meat. Corn meat, chicken livers, um, brand extensions that we import, so value-added brand extensions like tuna, like you know those high-value stuff. That's where we can see it. I, you know, and I don't think it stops there. I think there are other products. The, the, right now, the consumer, uh, the majority of South African consumer is under huge financial stress. Um, the, the, the market that we play in is all about affordability and availability. So where we, our view is we need to see Lucky Star in every corner cafe, every spaza store, every retail, every wholesaler. And that's where we are. We have one of the highest distribution uh, percentages in, in, in any food sector. So we give them, we make it available. And secondly, we make it affordable. And affordable is a relative game. You know, um, we don't see ourselves competing in the, in the cultured market. We see ourselves competing in the protein market. And protein can range from polonies to IQF chicken to offal to canned meat to canned cultures to baked beans. And that's the game we play. So we see, so, you know, and obviously consumers, the more stress they're under, uh, we're seeing customers buying down now. In fact, one of the growth areas, and I've, I've been asked this question before, where are you seeing any growth in the top end of the market? The top, we're seeing growth in the top end of the market. One of our, it's a very small base, 
but we've seen growth out of Woolworths. Um, and that's because, you know, people are buying down across the board into, so you've got to give them quality and you give them affordability and you give them availability. So we do see some, some opportunity to expand that trade. Hence the reason going into corn meat, canned meat, and chicken livers. Um, I just wanted to, you know, because it, it generally is a focus for um, unlock the stock viewers, uh, you know, dividends within companies uh, and policies. And we saw a big increase in this uh, this half yeah. dividend. Uh, I think it was up 50%, if I remember correctly, from the Prezzo here. Um, yeah. Maybe just touch on that and then just a broader dividend policy if there is a formalized one in place, just so, you know, that's on the record for people on the call. Yeah, so so we did recognize the exceptional first half performance, uh, you know, eighty six percent increase in headline earnings per share, but we are going on a on a massive capital capital expenditure program, um, and that's going to take us over the next three years, as Men Neville mentioned, one point two billion in South Africa and another three hundred million in the U.S. So that's some significant capital that we're reinvesting in our business. Uh, for us, part of what we are able to do is to be able to invest in our own business at our own multiple. And we think organically it's the best way to deploy our capital. And so from a capital allocation point of view, uh, this year we'll spend 700 million in capital, um, 300 in the first half, 400 in the second half, for example. Uh, and it's a massive expansion. And it's the first time we've built a new factory, for example, on the world West Coast uh, for at least the last 20 years. So a massive investment going into that, into that part of the world. It's one of the reasons the PIC loves Oceana is, is our second biggest shareholder, is because they like the capital program. We'll spend another 500 million next year and another 300 million the following year. And this includes obviously maintenance uh, capex and replacement capex. But from an expansion point of view, uh, that's really where we see the best benefit. And so taking cognizance of what our uh, debt uh, levels are likely to be, we will moderate our dividends accordingly. Um, so what we've done over the past few years is we had a dividend cover of about 1.5 times. We moved that to about 1.75. At the end of last year, it was 1.82. So bearing in mind there is some cyclicality in our business and bearing in mind the level of debt, we will come out to approximately a cover of about two times. But nothing is cast in stone. We don't have a policy per se. I think for us, it's really about investing in our own business and, you know, for us, that's the best deployment of our capital right now. Yeah, great. I just want to ask about the operating risk in the underlying businesses. So is it fair to say that the wild caught seafood side faces some of the bigger variability in terms of the catch, et cetera? Because it feels like it's quite focused on a you know specific product in a specific place, whereas the value chain on the sardine slash pilchards, for example, has a much more global flavor to it. So just to help investors understand the different levels of risk, the variability of the catch uh, across the divisions. Um, so let me just, before I talk about the variability of a catch just in the wild court, let me talk a bit about the market. So the one key thing about the wild court market is it's continually growing. People, wild court catch generally worldwide is finite. Quotas are not going up substantially. So if you look at over the last 20 years, all wild caught has been fairly stable. So supply is fairly stable, but demand is continuously growing. People are looking for sustainable wild caught as opposed to aquaculture, uh, fresh fish, fresh or frozen fish. So we've seen continuous strong demand from Africa, from Western Europe, from the States and from China. The key, the, the, the wild caught business is, and, and we don't control weather, we can't, don't control fishing, but generally catch rates have been reasonable. What has happened in the short term is, is this uh, upgrading our vessels, which has taken some vessels out, but it's not, it's not hugely variable. I mean, there are short-term variances when you do have poor weather. Most of our bigger vessels, weather doesn't affect them. They can fish in big storms. So obviously, the smaller vessels do, do battle, um, but it's not a, a hugely variable thing. You've got to, it does drive costs. Catch rates drive costs. The higher your catch rate, the lower your costs because your, your vessel is... A, generally a fixed cost. You use the same fuel, the same crew, the same maintenance, whether you catch one kilo or 100 tons. So catch rates drive that. As long as the resource is in reasonable state 
And generally across the board, because of our, our well-managed fisheries, all of us, all of the species we manage or we fish in are fairly well managed and growing. So there is some variability, but it's not as 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 wide as people think because you know that you can't fish or fish are going to disappear. Generally, wild caught this year has had a poor first half, but over the over the last 10 years has been a very steady contributor to the to the Oceana stable. And if I can just add one other thing is that we've taken the opportunity to invest in our vessels because breakdowns, you, you don't want to have breakdowns. You want to put yourself in the best position. So we try to control the factors that we can control. That means having reliable vessels, being able to be, uh, you know, lack of breakdowns, for example, is, is a big drive of ours. So when we found that we had uh, the fishing rights uh, being awarded for 15 years, it allowed us to invest with confidence. And we've taken the opportunity with some of the breakdowns now to pull forward dry docks, for example, spend capital expanding production facilities on the vessels so that when fishing uh, comes back and the, the resource is available, that we're in the best position to optimize. I mean, just to expand a bit on that rights allocation process. In South Africa, government allocates rights to companies and they're allocated for a 15 year period. We've just come through that allocation process where you have to apply for rights uh, and you get renewed. Oceana has renewed all of our rights and we've now got rights um, for the next 15 years. So we know uh, exactly what percentage of the TAC we're entitled to. So it gives us a lot more certainty in terms of future finance and future capex in terms of what we, because we know exactly what it is. The resource is the resource and if it's managed properly, we will catch that our, our percentage of the resource. Um, Zaf, maybe one, one for you, just on seasonality in the business. I mean, it's quite a, a decent decent swing 60 60 40 on uh, on average if you look back through that through that bar chart can you just give us a, a bit of insight of you know what causes that seasonality is it you know um you know one business you know doing doing well in the first half versus the versus the second half traditionally that impacts it or is it down to fishing rights and seasons in in you know china versus you know south africa just just so we understand you know what actually drives it and it should it moderate over time as you know these investments start to come on stream you know you're branching out you know lucky star which shouldn't have such big seasonality variances so historically we've been at first half 40 second half 60 and and that's been the case for at least the last five years on average some some there's been some some differences what happened last year was unique in that we had this very high fish oil price um, so it, it did skew the numbers towards Daybrook in the first half. So that's the one thing is that we've, uh, the operating margin out of our uh, Daybrook business was 47%, compared to where you'd get operating margins on average in Lucky Star at about 10 to 12%. So it does skew our numbers slightly. We expect that the fish oil price will moderate going forward. We don't expect it's going to remain that high for that long period of time. And now with Peru coming back on stream, we expect the fish oil price to moderate. So that's the one driver of, of our earnings and whether it's first half or second half. And our fishing season in the US runs from about the middle of April to the end of October. So we catch fish during the year and depending on how those catch rates go, we carry over fish meal and fish oil stocks at the end of our financial year being September. And what happened last year is we carried significantly more stock into the current year into the current half year that is. And part of the reason for doing that is that we wanted to satisfy customer demand. Rather than selling that fish meal and fish oil into the spot market, we, are, we have four or five really big fish oil customers and about 10 or 12 big pet food customers that we sell into. It also helps that we sell our fish meal into the domestic market into the US. It does help us with freight costs, for example. And typically around the world, fish meal is produced for local consumption the only exception being Peru, which has a lot of its exports into China. So cyclicality, we would think that we would go more towards a 50-50 uh, based on what I'm saying about us satisfying customer demand and making sure that we don't let our customers down. And we've been able to do that consistently. And with the growth in aquaculture, aquaculture is, is now ahead of wild caught and has been so for the last three years and continues to grow. 
And so we sell into that market. So we are in aquaculture, we supply into that market and it's an important market for us. So I would think that on a 50-50 basis is what you can look at going forward. And just a follow-up question, uh, if I can, I'll squeeze it in here before the boss gets in another one. Just on Daybrook, you talked about the margin there, you know, being 47%, you know, like a really exceptional performance. But, you know, what should kind of people think on a more normalized basis? You know, Peru comes back on stream and we get, you know, prices kind of revert to the mean, even on a mean reversion basis. Like, what should we be thinking there? Or people be thinking if they're looking at Daybrook, obviously not repeating its same performance again. You know, what's kind of a, a normalized kind of view from, from you guys? So, so assume me, and I'll, and I'll let uh, Neville talk about the fish oil price in a bit, but depending on the fish oil price, we expect margins on a consistent basis to be between 28 and 30% in that business. Now, fish oil prices have been at $2,000 uh, a ton uh, previously, and uh, we, we've been able to sell just north of $5,000 a ton. And, and that's the reason why the operating profit jumped to 47%. And so we've been able to extract value out of that. Um, we, we don't think that the fish oil prices are going to go back to $2,000. We think that with the growth of aquaculture, that there will be consistent demand. Also, our customers like our product because we're able to consistently supply them. They're not having to go into the spot market. And, and salmon, uh, salmon feeding, for example, is a very tricky business. You don't want to be running out of uh, feed because they grow quite quickly. I don't know if you want to comment on the fish oil price. Yeah. Yeah, just maybe to comment on the on the split. If you go back in history, Oceana was a two thirds, one third, sorry, one third, two thirds in terms of operating profit. One third in the first half, two thirds in the second half. Before we acquired um, Daybrook, and the reason being is that most of the production uh, for Lucky Star uh, happens in the second half. So our factories tend to be closed over December, November, December period. Remember, our, our financial year runs September through to October. And then a lot of the production and the recovery of fixed overheads comes through the second half and it was two thirds. Daybrook has, 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 has moderated that because of the way the, what, of what um, Zaf has spoken about. So it should be more 50 50 now. We had an exceptional oil price and it was a, it was a once off, uh, I think. Um, Peru is the largest producer of fish meal and fish oil in the world. They produce about five, they catch about five million tons. They had a shocking season because of climate age, climate and, and La Nina effect last year, and they literally caught almost nothing. Um, they themselves and, they, and and the U.S. are the two main producers of high omega fish oils that go into the salmon farm. With them not producing last year, there was a massive shortage of fish oil worldwide, and hence the price going from $2,500 to $6,000. That we don't believe will be repeated. What we do believe is that the one thing that the salmon farmers have found out is there isn't a natural alternative to fish oil. They, they, when the shortage came about, they started looking at all sorts of alternate protein sources from soya to other products to see if they could feed that because obviously they were trying to keep price down. And what is they've realized that the high omega-3s that are in our oil are necessary to keep the health and the growth of the fish. So we will expect that price to moderate, but we'll, we don't expect it to go back to their historical levels. So probably somewhere in between, which then would be, which would then would balance uh, Daybrook's operating performance in the first and second half, combined with the lucky star. So I agree with Zaf. The long term is probably a 50, more like a 50-50 basis than than we're seeing at the moment, 60-40. Um, I think probably. Ghost. The last question from my side that we have time for. I just wanted to touch on the acquisition strategy. So the bolt-ons you were talking about. So will that be to stick with the current strategy, which is quite focused on the primary agri side and actually doing the fishing? Or do you think some of these bolt-ons might be further down the value chain and actually give you route to market, maybe some more brands, that kind of uh, stuff? You can never say never, finance goes, but... The focus, obviously, in the Lucky Star is to extend, expand the brand. In the wild court side, there are opportunities in the full value chain. As you might have seen, we've just acquired an additional squid business. Uh, we bought a, a squid business that was for sale. And I think there's certainly opportunities in SA to, to widen, to add on to our existing fishing businesses, to, to increase our, our, our percentage of the, of the catch. Um, 
So I see that as 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 um, as opportunities. And then in the wider in the wider, you know, obviously we are in the in the states, we are in 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 Africa. Um, we don't have um, on the ground businesses in Europe, which is a big market. So there are some opportunities to get further down the value chain, as you were saying. In in particular, in the Western Europe opera, and, and there's and there's a number of opportunities that come across our desk. So you know, we we're certainly not excluding that. We do, if we go into fishing rights, we certainly want to own the fishing rights. In other words, they have at least fifty one percent ownership. I don't want to be in a in a foreign country where I don't have control of the vessels. So that is certainly a, a prime motivator for us. And there are opportunities. Some countries don't allow it, so, but many countries do allow foreign ownership of fishing rights. So that's where we would certainly look across the board. Uh, Neville Zaff, um, thank you very much. I don't think we've got the time to squeeze any more in, and I do want uh, yeah, to bring Vanessa back in just to kind of wrap up for us here. Vanessa, I'll hand back to you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you to the Finance Ghost, and thanks to everyone who joined us today, but a special thanks to Neville and Zaff for making the time and to chat to the retail investors. We really do appreciate that. We hope that you've enjoyed the session. If you want to listen to the recording, it'll be on the YouTube uh, channel's uh, website next week. And we encourage you to subscribe, please, if you want to get up to date um, on everything that we put on there. Our next session of Unlock the Stock will take place on the 27th of June, and that features a returning company in the format of Spear Reed and a new company, AdCorp, which will be joining us. Um, and just as one other reminder, July is a very, very full session for us. We have a company reporting every week in July, which is lovely. All those details are on the website. So that is it from my side. Thank you very much to Oceana for participating. And um, goodbye to everyone that's on the call. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.